I told uh, uh, Ms. Amy Yen to speak to us. Amy is the uh, Executive Secretary of the Association for the Advancement of Feminism, which is the first feminist group in Hong Kong established by the local Chinese in 1984. The association focuses its work on policy advocacy, gender mainstreaming, and promoting feminism. She is responsible for the organization's daily operation, finance, fundraising, and working hand-in-hand -hand with the executive committee and various working groups on the association's uh, organizational development. So, uh, thank you, please. Um, so, I'm going to introduce uh, one of the projects that we are undergoing right now, because uh, we are a local feminist group and we have uh, currently parallel multiple projects uh, undergoing. So this is only one of our uh, projects that we are doing on gender budgeting in the local level. So what, um, uh, this is our uh, in, introduction. So we are mainly a group that uh, eliminating discrimination against women and also promoting gender awareness in Hong Kong context. And our organization is very simple. We have a council uh, similar to Arena and then the council will elect the executive member and parallel to the executive member we have uh, various program groups that are uh, undergoing uh, different programs. So uh, gender budget group is one of them. And it is, uh, so a few features of this uh, program is that we are using the gender mainstreaming framework on, uh, on uh, against the structural discrimination to uh, women and LGBT. And also we focus a lot on a lot on gender impact assessment on the policy that uh, on different government le level, for example healthcare policy. So the impact on the gender minority or the caretaker, like uh, if in the public healthcare system, uh, or very often caretaker will take a very long time of waiting and also accompanying the sick person. So what is the impact of the healthcare policy on them? And also poverty alleviation policy. So what is the um, effect on the uh, female in poverty? And also a policy that related to social reproduction. How it affects uh, unpaid care work and how uh, the social security uh, scheme does not cover uh, like housewife or people who is not in the employment market. And also employment discrimination to people with family responsibility. Like a housewife, uh, if she needs to take care of the sick person or a family member, she will be very much discriminated by the labor market. So these are our concerns and women is never a single entity. They have different uh, identity and also uh, men as well. So uh, one of the projects that we are going to talk about is gender budgeting in Hong Kong. Uh, I will be very, very, very brief and very fast. It established in uh, 2009. And first, we do a lit literature study on uh, gender budgeting experience in, in the global uh, uh, global in a different country, and we found out that not many countries have gender budgeting program that going on, and especially in the central government level. The only one we can find in Asia is uh, Korea. So immediately we organize a study group to Korea and see oh what it is about. So it's kind of um, uh, uh, con uh, people alliance. We uh, connected with the local group, the labor group, and the women group and to see uh, if there is anything that we could learn from. And then uh, we, we, learned, we did learn something and then come back to Hong Kong, we started some survey and also some uh, involvement in the local politics. And then uh, that is the story how it's going on. So let's go back to the Korea study. So we went, to, uh, we went there in 2010, so maybe some friend from Korea could uh, supplement our experience. And we visited the Ministry of Gender Equality and Family in the Republic of Korea. So, uh, and also we visited some local group that are doing a lot of participatory budgeting. So it's, and then we find out that it's two very different level of things. One, the, the gender budgeting in Korea is very centralized. And then uh, it has to be uh, when you have a general election as the key condition. But in Hong Kong, we are not so sure we have that. And we cannot see in the very short future, like in one or two decades, we will have that. So we don't think we can have something like this in, in this scale. But when we visit the uh, people group in the uh, country level or the county level, we see a lot of participatory budgeting. 
and a lot of projects that involve uh, local people a lot. So we got the inspiration of, of it, and then we think that maybe it is uh, possible that we go back to Hong Kong and then um, try something in the local government level, that is the district council. So we started some uh, small-scale survey in some sort of district. That is a district of uh, 370,000 population in uh, Kowloon, and it's the, one of the poorest uh, districts in Hong Kong. So we uh, surveyed on um, the women living condition in this area from different aspects like healthcare, housing, expenses on food, transportation, employment, and unpaid care work. And then immediately we started some uh, community forum and discussion with the political party and various community organizations and share our experience on this survey. Then people start interested in this kind of uh, this kind of uh, condition and because in the district council they have a subgroup that concern on the poverty problem in that district. So we enter into that subgroup and then voice out our concern of uh, uh, female living condition and why there are so many poor and what is our contribution to, this, uh, to understanding this problem. And then we also went to Penei for a study tour on the gender responsive participatory budgeting. But that is uh, very different because they never, never advertise it as a gender budgeting project or the gender budgeting aspect. So um, we have to ask a lot of questions and then analysis uh, a bit to understanding what is going on in that project. And we realized that uh, because when we are uh, saying participatory project, it involves a lot of different people and different identity and different social status. So it is not only women that being affected, but of course women is one of the very important factors. But once we put people into different identity and also um, different level of marginalization, immediately some of the elements that uh, come out is uh, like the old women, uh, caretaker, um, people who take care of the sick and the elderly and the uh, child care, mostly the burden is on women. So um, by, by dividing or to um, outline the different uh, people's identity, we, uh, we are able to come up with something uh, more or less gender based. And then back to Hong Kong, we also uh, advertise on it. And then this time we work together with a civil alliances. That is an alliances of uh, a lot of local group together. And they have different concerns, not only gender, like uh, poverty or uh, participation or uh, housing or uh, the, um, uh, the public uh, health care, something like that. And then the, uh, we organize some hearing forum trying to mobilize the local people to voice out their need and their, uh, and their, what they want from the district council. Because traditionally in Hong Kong, district council is only um, an election system that you vote every four years. But that is the only act that people involve. You, count, you cast the vote and then you forget about it. Or when you've got a problem, you go to the district councillor and ask for help. There is not much participation uh, element in it. So by uh, organizing here in Forum, we're trying to mobilize people uh, to voice out and to participate in the district council more than casting a vote. And then, further step, we, do a, we did a research on uh, district council fund allocation. Because district council actually is quite wealthy and they have some kind of fund allocation. But the fund allocation uh, criteria is very, uh, where we, um, they only have the criteria according to the need. But what is the need mean? Um, uh, what does it mean? Is there is no uh, clear criteria, so it is mo mostly uh, monopolized by the councillor and by the people who have time to attend the council meeting. So we are trying to voice out that 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 problem and that, that is also on the current news saying that the transparency and the criteria of the district council fund location is not so clear and, um, and its effect on uh, alleviating poverty is not so good. So uh, by, by this study we are trying to focus on what is the criteria that we could have and also what is the impact assessment that we could do uh, to, to the various fund allocation project. 
so in in this process, we we have the chance to voice out that the um, it is always the gender aspect and also the class aspect in that. And <coughs> together with this survey, we also. Uh, because it created some impact and some pressure on the council uh, and on political party. And in the uh, district council, a difference of uh, one or two hundred uh, vote is already very determined to they, whether they can win the seat or not. So they become very concerned when some people voice out there is a problem in the final location of the district council. So uh, some gospel group also been very concerned how they could participate more and articulate their need into the district council. And also political party as well, because um, they want to win vote. So they have to, they have to um, articulate clear, clear in a clear way that how they could benefit people in their agenda. So that is the way that we attract attention from this group. So it's a very simple um, project actually. But uh, from the experience that we we um, we undergo this process in the past 10, 10 years, maybe eight or ten years, um, the experience of other country is uh, is uh, in the local context is very important because uh, in the grassroots level they may never have the chance to go to other country and visit with their with their experience of what is gender budget and what is it mean. Um, so once we carry that um, experience back into the local context, we have the um, privilege or uh, we have the advantage of um, adding our own agenda into it. For example, when we see South Korea, they have a very strong tradition on participatory budgeting. <coughs> then we could uh, add into the element of gender assessment into it, although originally it may not be so. And um, so that is important. But it is also important that for the local group uh, like AF, uh, we have to have a very clear agenda on what we want to achieve. And in the process, we are also an, an undergoing a selection process of what is important for this uh, foreign experience in the local context. So that is an active participation in our part to articulating this experience rather than. Um, Rather than some kind of um, uh, some something that written on paper, we cannot understand it that clearly, and we cannot understand its context and ch and translate into the local context. So this is one aspect of it, and the other is um, the challenge that we have is the in the local uh, political uh, atmosphere in Hong Kong uh, because it's very polarized. It's either pan-democratic or uh, the conservative. So when we are working into the local level, we have to be very careful and sensitive to this kind of, uh, it is not even um, rational debate, it is kind of uh, emotional sentiment. Once you, once people think that you belong to a certain, certain camp, then everything you propose will be objected in the meeting table. So a lot of effort needs to be made. And in this process, uh, the gender analysis is very much and very easily being undermined and saying it is not the urgent need. But so what we have to do is uh, repeatedly um, saying that poverty is uh, very much related to an affecting female in the community. So um, this has to be going on every day and every meeting and every time we see the media and every meeting, every workshop we are undergoing. And um, hold it in the and in the when we are doing training in the political party, we also undergoing the same problem. Traditionally, political party is um, have a very strong male dominant uh, culture, and they will think that gender thing is only for female or for women. So every time we have a, some some kind of workshop that related to gender, only the female will attend. And we are trying to so when we are when we are using the terms uh, in analysis or the identity that we are trying to say um, what is who will be benefit from this kind of a project we are saying uh, caretaker or people excluded from the environment uh, employment market so that means both men and women will be affected so this is uh, some of the um, keywords or some of the way that the rating the. The, the problem we need to be aware of. So that is some some of the um, 
insight that we are going to share with you. Thank you. Hi everyone, and, and Kimchi didn't mention that she was my supervisor when I did my <laughs> cultural studies PhD here. Um, oh, now the, the the good thing about uh, going last, I suppose, is that you take advantage of the intellectual resources of all those who come before you at the conference. So uh, I'll just do two things here. I'll basically synthesize, you know, some of what you've presented. So not much here is new. And the other thing I'll do is I, I basically have been thinking about social change for a while. And uh, I have a bit of a program here that is that you know that I just conceived of lately. Uh, and so I will welcome comments. Um, so, so let me start. Um, in, in the last few days I, I will start with the diagnosis of our situation and I'll I, I'm saying this from the perspective of a, a decolonial uh, scholar, I guess, a decolonial... I, I don't know how to classify or categorize myself, but I guess I'm a product of colonization. <laughs> um, so yes, on the first day we talked about the West and the rest, and uh, um, uh, as particularly the cultural logic of empire, and I, I mean, the, the converse, this topic has run through all our discussions. Um, you know, es essentially, uh, the r the world is governed by what Quijano calls a colonial matrix of power, right? And and, and its pillars are, uh, you know, the realm of politics, where you know there's only a certain legitimate form of political system that takes after a Judeo-Christian um, that that takes that that has Judeo-Christian beginnings, right? Then that was secularized. And the mainstream view is now liberalism, or the alternative is Marxism. Um, I'd like to stress, especially the Judeo-Christian heritage of this. You know, I would argue that um, the Marxian story of revolution is a secularized version of the story of salvation. I mean, uh, just just think about that. It's 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 an argument um, where instead of God, you you have humanity basically. And that's particularly the working class, right? Uh, bring, bringing us, delivering us, emancipating us. Um, then we have the realm of material production. You know, these days it's the realm of capitalist economy. Um, previously, there was, as Professor Dai mentioned, you know, there was at least a, a, basically some competition from socialism. But nonetheless, I'd argue that both are derived from a materialist worldview, right? So. One could say that the difference between Marx and Smith uh, is not so much in e each other contesting the, the object of the economy, but in, in contesting over how the distribution uh, of the economy's products. Um, um, the third realm of knowledge, yeah, the third realm is the third pillar on which this colonial matrix uh, that were dominated or that were embedded in is, is that of the realm of knowledge and I guess in this uh, it is science that is seen to be the superior form of knowledge particularly materialist science which is Newtonian science um, of course quantum physics has way surpassed that but most scientists still disregard that uh, the fourth realm is of course the realm of subjectivity uh, and which conceives of the individual as the rational subject of history um, Within this realm of subjectivity, we can talk about culture, we can talk about languages. It is why uh, the imperial languages, you know, the European languages, are the ones that are prominent. Um, so that's it. And, and I think most of our discussions it can be fit within this. You know, we are struggling within this. And, and, and so, as a post colonial or a, 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 as someone from the South, you know, it's, it's been our historical problem, right? We didn't. We didn't necessarily invent this, but we cannot avoid it. It's come to us. Um, so I, I say the colonial matrix of power is Eurocentric, uh, and it's contingent on Western elite control of these elements. Okay, it's always uh, subjected to manipulation by these elites. Um, and I, I define Eurocentrism quite simply as the belief that the historical experience of the West should be the fate of all humanity. Right? So Eurocentrism, not just in the way we know 
but in the way we be, where we, we are, right? So not just a way of knowing, but a way of being. Um, and that's why in the first day we talked about an unjust uh, world order, right? And, and this dates all the way back, I guess some um, scholars argue, Quijano would, uh, from the 16th century. We are, of course, seeing a rearrangement, uh, we, we heard this today, of, of some of these items in the matrix today. Um, but nonetheless, you know, this whole experience of modernity has been seen by the self, the global self, as one of darkness, right? So for a long time, Europe has celebrated its achievements or glorified its uh, modernity, right, as the, the pinnacle of its achievement. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really the other side of modernity is, is coloniality. And this is what the experience of uh, people in the South has been and continues to be. Uh, it's important that I mention coloniality rather than colonization. So coloniality is this logic that has um, driven the system, right? So you don't have to be white, you can be black, you can be yellow. And this is why the worry of China, and previously Japan, etc. Uh, anyone can embrace this project. So this is indeed our problem, right? How to break free from this matrix of power, how to extricate ourselves from this logic. Um, and there's deep confusion among us um, because of the, again, you know, we're subjected to certain basically Western categories of knowledge. Most of us who have been through a colonial education, I'm the product of that. Uh, I went to school in Singapore, former British colony. I went to school in Australia, former British colony. I went to school in the US, former British colony. Then I came to Hong Kong. Former British colony, and now I'm in the UK. Oh, the heart of an empire, <laughs> or, or former empire. So, so indeed, I mean, we 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 are in a deep crisis because we don't know where to turn for even uh, resources or knowledge, right? So, as someone who was educated in, in, or at least my first degree was in economics, I turned to political economy, and and Marx was radical. It was very very radical for me, but. Uh, if you actually have, a, I, I think, a decolonial perspective or a non-Western-centric perspective, then then you begin to appreciate that you know, like I said before, Marx and Smith are uh, basically, you know, have the, have the same objectives uh, in, in in many ways in terms of uh, the purpose of human existence, right? The idea of materialism, uh, the adoption of a materialist cosmology. Um, of course, that's not to discredit Marx at all. I learned a lot through, you know, from my Marxist friends, and the, the impact of Marx in political economy has, has been profound in, in any kind of analysis of, you know, the system that we live in. Um, so again, you know, left, right, uh, socialism, capitalism. Um, I, I I think there are variants, right, of a. a you know, one, one theme. And, and I must say that uh, before I came to China, I, I really, it's only after that I, I came to China that I realized that uh, in, indeed, you know, that, that, that despite the appearance of China embracing capitalism, etc., uh, they, they inherently practice different values. Um, I don't know how to basically express it necessarily, but in everyday practice, um, I, I mean, maybe we can go to Fei Xiaotong or, or, or someone like that, you know, who talks about uh, the self being embedded within a whole, what's this, system of concentric circles, right? Where, where social relations are grounded in a certain mutuality, right? And, and it's not this a priori uh, conception of the individual, right, bearing all these abstract rights. Uh, so I, I never understood any of that. I mean, maybe when I was younger, I saw these practices within my family and extended family. But this is not something you learn at school, you see? This is, this is why it's so interesting. Uh, we, we, we basically are educated or decultured through formal education. Um, and and what's, what's valuable, what's in fact very valuable, 
is completely neglected in, in formal education. Um, so that, that's why I talked about that, that's why I talk about this modernity and this conception of the individual as you know as a rational subject of history, right? That 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 idea pervades all our political systems, um, and that is no wonder. I mean, we the, the conception's wrong. You know, the, the, the Hobbesian conception that life is nasty, brutish, and short, and that we are all self-seeking and selfish individuals. I mean, that is a a wrong premise, and, and as such, you know, I, I think we have to reconceptualize this, right? We, we need to understand ourselves again. And this is why I say it, it took me so long to come to China and then realize that, hey, these people operate according to different civilizational logics, different cultural logics. Um, and yet I still belong to a, a China studies listserv. You know, you have China scholars who will not try to understand, we will not entertain the, the, the idea of understanding China on its own terms. You know, it's always the same, oh, you know, this is an authoritarian regime, you know. I mean, there's that, of course, but uh, that's another issue, I think. Right? So, I mean, by virtue of the fact that we're stuck within this matrix, we live lives that are severely imbalanced, right? Imbalanced between ourselves, in balance within ourselves, um, and of course with nature. Okay, now basically that's that's my gloomy uh, diagnos di diagnosis of the problem. Now it's not that nobody here knows about it, but been talking about it. Let me turn to something maybe that that can offer some hope. It's a very modest plan, uh, but wait before we get there, more more gloomy news. Um, I, I would like to talk about subjectivity and, and yesterday I, I heard some some news about suicide and when I was in the US I was always fascinated by these gun shootings, these mass shootings. Uh, of course I, I, I kept uh, the company of, of, of some anarchists, you know, primitivists and, and they were always saying, ah, this is this is civilization, this is the cost of civilization and I thought they were, you know, they were a bit uh, on the margins, which they are, but uh, I realized that they, they, they have a point. Um, um, these shootings are, have been increasing with tremendous frequency you know, over the time I was there, and, and it continues still today. Um, and I, I think it is uh, what I think Sayaka was talking about yesterday, you know, this profound sense of alienation, Enemy, you know what Durkheim calls enemy, you know, angst. You know, in modern modern life, we, we don't know what it is to have an authentic life. Uh, we are, we live, you know, a fractured existence from from each other, and uh, yeah, we, we, we cannot, we don't even know authenticity if it's even before our faces. Um, and I've been following some, I've been reading some words about mental disease, and it turns out that one in four college students is mentally ill, they're so severely depressed. Um, so this is a problem, I mean this is, this is a, a problem and in Japan we have this phenomenon of hikikikomori and in China it's called tai. Um I was in London last year and I had a Hong Kong flatmate who, uh, he was a flatmate for six months and in that time I think I saw him once. Uh, I don't even think he had to go to the toilet, but it's amazing. So I, I, I think that they are, you know, these these problems, these sub problems of subjectivity should not be diminished, right? They should not be neglected. I, I think they say something about uh, the times we live in. Um, it's, it's what Weber calls, you know, the disenchantment of the world. You know, there's a loss of meaning, right? Okay, so now for, for this project, and I, I must confess to having a, a past life, I mean a, a double life, a second life, uh, not, not the one in the computer, but before I was a scholar, uh, I used to be a professional athlete. Um, I was just talking to Ed and Tessa about this. Uh, I've never talked about this, you see, and I, I think it's the same kind of dichotomy that, that, that uh, that splits the mind and the body. It's the Cartesian dualism, right? So I become an intellectual and I'm, the intellect has nothing to the body, right? But don't forget that the intellect is better than the body. It's supreme. It's, it's the organ of reason, 
right? And, and I never knew how to reconcile these two parts, these two halves of my life. I spent 70, maybe almost 20 years of my life playing tennis very seriously. Um, but just last uh, month, suddenly everything came together. Uh, and I'm not just, let, let, let me see what's in the next slide. I don't know what I'm going to say. Ah, okay. It, it, it came to me because I realized that, you know, these two halves need not be apart. I mean, they're apart because of how we've conceived of, uh, how we've conceived of humanity, right? This, uh, of ourselves. Mind, body, split. Right? When we are one ontological whole, you know, we split ourselves into two. And I, and I realized that uh, for a long time I was quite embarrassed about being a sports person because after I became an intellectual, you know, you, you have these Marxist ideas and, ah, oh, you know, these professional athletes are quite bourgeois, they're in the service of capital, which is all true. Which is all true, and that, that's why I had such difficulty talking about this. Um, you know, they become celebrities, and they, they're part of this celebrity culture. They help us forget the problems. You know, all all valid critique. But 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 then I realized something. I, I realized that uh, I realized that sport teaches you a lot. Huh? In the first place, sport teaches you discipline, teaches you respect, teaches you patience, it teaches you problem solving. Um, now these are elements that are necessary in any education any you know, schooling environment. Yet try teaching this to someone in a classroom and compare this with how these skills are picked up in, in the conviviality of play. You know, when you're enjoying yourself, you don't think, you have to concentrate, otherwise the ball's gonna hit you in the eye, right? So after a while, you know, it, it, this, this is embodied, you know, these skills are embodied, okay? And, uh, so I'm, I'm talking about some of these necessary values that we need to survive in this world um, that can be acquired through play, through sport. Uh, another important thing about sport and play is, you know, games are like a ritual, but they take place within the context of certain boundaries, meaning there are rules to these games. Uh, what's the importance of that? Well, these rituals exist outside the banality or the mundanity of everyday capitalist life. You know, you, you know when you're playing and you know when the game ends. And you have to respect rules. In this gangster age of financial capitalism, one of the problems is, you know, no, no, no one gives a damn about the other. So sport allows you, actually, this, this room, this space, where you confront the other, even competitive sport, or I should say especially competitive sport, you confront the other as an equal. And when the game's over, you shake hands, right? This is sportsmanship. So I, I'm beginning to realize all these, you know, important values that sport can teach us, uh, capitalist or not, right? Modern or not. Um, and, and this is why I am proposing this now. Um, I, I am saying, uh, that we have to use some of the more corrupt aspects of modern life. I mean, even celebrity culture. I was thinking, if you had celebrities who could actually comment in, in you know, substantively on social issues, that would reach a far greater audience than any one of us can, right? And, and so, you know, I have a friend in Thailand, he, he was the number one Asian player for a long time. Um, um, but, you know, he, he, he never had anything else other than, than tennis, you know, but he, he was widely popular throughout Asia, okay? And I was thinking to myself, what if this guy had a, you know, a, a, a social and a political consciousness, right? He would, he would reach far more people than we could. So, so this is, in short, this is my plan. I mean, my plan is to revive this, um, athletic component. I will call it aesthetic component of my life. Aesthetic as opposed to anesthetic, which is feeling numb. Right? Sport also brings out all those things that a humanities education brings out, or aims to bring out. Um, so my, 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 my point is this. Uh, to use sport to re-enchant the world, we can do this by actually taking sport to, to or reformulating education. I mean, putting 
important not just as to accompany classroom education, but if you had a, I think if we, if I did the research and and so okay, certain values can be acquired or instilled through certain sporting activities. My time's up. Um, okay, I, I, I guess that's that's all I wanted to say. I, I think there's some potential. Thank you. Oh, so uh, first, I'm going to apologize for my terrible English. Uh, I'm living in Macau since uh, January 2017. Since uh, this, the last 14 years of my life, I lived in uh, in France and in Brazil. So I'm not used to use English. I apologize. It's terrible. I have an accent, a terrible accent. I apologize. So. Uh, this presentation will be a little bit different from the precedent presentation, so I will talk uh, about uh, Portugal and Brazil. It's a little bit far away also of the subject of this session, but um, I think uh, I will bring some elements to think about the alliance buildings that we can build between different countries and uh, among, uh, among activists. So, uh, I'm going to present uh, myself uh, also. So I'm Portuguese, uh, I'm working at the Polytechnic Institute of Macau, and in my research, I perform a transdisciplinary and an interdisciplinary study applying political economics categories to sociology and to literature. So it means that I have to read because I, I don't have Engl enough English uh, to do it without reading, okay? So uh, it means that um, I apply Marxist categories on literature research. For example, my postdoctoral research was on the agrarian question in Portugal and Brazil through literature. So, uh, I'm here uh, at Arena to talk about the Portuguese exchanges with Latin America social movements, particularly with the MST, the Brazilian Landless Workers Movement, the biggest social movement in Latin America. America. So uh, this presentation will be a little bit like a breath historian exercise. So I lived the, among the MST for for years. So I'm a Marxist. I teach in their uh, political school. Uh, I don't know if uh, you know the school. The school names Florestan Fernandes National School. Uh, but to understand the exchanges between Portuguese activists and to understand why I went to Brazil, why I went to do my postdoctoral research about agrarian questions, working with Marxist categories, teaching at the MST school, I think it is important to have in account to uh, to have in account two key issues. First. Brazil was a Portuguese colony since the 16th century till the 19th century. And second, we can only understand the capitalist development both in Portugal and in Brazil if only if you have in account the agrarian question, which is the basis of the capitalist development. So. The exchanges between pro progressist and revolutionary movements and also political parties of both countries were always very narrow, but it had a particular development during the industrialization process of both countries in the 1930s. This exchange increases during the fin financial capitalism in the 60s and on the 70s when both countries were under a grisly and violent dictatorship. Both dictatorships were supported by a dominant class of land owners. Effectively, Portugal had the longest dictatorship 
in Europe, 48 years. This terrorist dictatorship was an instrument in the service of the interest of big landowners and monopolies. During this period, the development of, uh, of capitalism brought some changes in the countryside, like, for example, mechanization. Nevertheless, this mechanization was only affordable for a small group of big landowners, while the majority of agriculture workers or small peasants were landless or do not have means to buy machines or fertilizers. Small peasants and rural workers were then submitted to the big land owners. In the south of Portugal, where large pro property prevails, agriculture work agriculture it's difficult uh, agricultural <laughs> workers were over exploited. To I'm using here uh, Rui Mauro Marinis. It is a Brazilian Marxist, very known uh, among uh, the left. And um, so he used this category of over-exploited to explain the highly precarious conditions in which workers uh, live in South uh, America. And am I using it to apply it on Portugal? But it was also from these Portuguese workers of the South, highly uh, in, pre uh, in that worked in highly precarious conditions, that the struggle for land and better life conditions started. When Portuguese Revolution arrives on 25 April 1974, and when this Portuguese Revolution ends with 48 years of violence and oppression, Small peasants and mostly rural workers were waiting impatiently for changes. In Brazil, the situation was then a little bit different. In the, if the dictatorship in Brazil starts in 64, it will only finish in 1985. When in 1974, the Portuguese Revolution claims a socialist model to the Portuguese society, Brazil was suffering a deep violence. The 1970s have saw the end of the last Brazilian guerrilla, which last members were killed or murdered in 1972. In this context, the Brazilian peasant struggle was very difficult. Even so, it is in the late 70s that the land occupations by landless peasants will take place. This occurred in the south of Brazil, a territory in which agriculture development had dependent on the process of colonization started in the late 19th century by poor European peasants. This new landless movement was strongly influenced by Catholic progressist organizations of countryside and marks the beginning of a new class organization. Uh, and it is the beginning of the history of the MST, which was founded in 1984. And we cannot forget that the MST earliest priority claimed was the agrarian reform law enforcement. Curiously, or maybe not, this law, the agrarian reform, was approved by the Brazilian dictatorship in 1964. Later, in 1970, the dictatorship also creates the National Institute for Colonization and Agrarian Reform that still exists today. INCRA is a federal agency with responsibility over land reform and managing public lands. Also, it was created to set up an agrarian reform. Dictatorship used this institution mostly to colonize the lands with few or any Brazilian, 
as in the case of the Amazonian region. Despite the agrarian law, Brazilian dictatorship, like the Portuguese one, set up an agriculture model, model concentrating more and more land and with, in which the agriculture modernization was selective, excluding the small peasants. The consequence was the advanced, advancement of an agri-exporter model, the intensive use of fertilizers confirming the capitalist tendency to the concentration of land and capital. The land occupations on the late 17th continued during the 80s and became a source of resistance against dictatorship and for the implementation of a real agrarian reform. Meanwhile, in Portugal, the Portuguese revolutions opens the way for a new agriculture model, bringing hope for social changes to all workers, mostly agriculture worker, workers, even in Brazil. Portugal will know an agrarian reform. It is not implemented like in Brazil, from up, from the state to bottom, but from bottom to, uh, from the bottom to the up, top. <laughs> so, this means that it was the landless rural worker struggle that imposed to the new revolutionary government a new rural model. After the revolution, South Portuguese rural workers will organize big land occupations. In response to this, landlords put fire on occupied lands, destroy the production and the machines. The agrarian reform law only appears after the land occupations. As I, I want only to show one minute of a video like that, you can have an idea what does it mean. And okay, okay. It's in Portuguese, but I only, it's only one minute, only to... You are going to feel the intensity of the occupations, the discussions, because the, the rural workers, they were, before the occupations, they discussed a lot, they fight, the, so only to feel how it was. So they are discussing if they are going to make a cooperative, how they are going to occupy the land. So this was the the ambience and the rural portion. And they are discussing if it is going to be of the cooperative or if the belongs to the to the worker. It is of it is of it is mine or I'm going to give it to the cooperative. One says no, it is of the cooperative. He says no, it is mine. I don't want to give it. So the problems that uh, appeared at that time. Uh, so. On 29 April 75, the Portuguese government legislates those occupations. From then on, all properties with more than 700 hectares or uncultivated properties were expropriated. Before the Portuguese Revolution, only 94,000 uh, 94, hectares were cultivated. After the agrarian reform approval, this figure rose to more than 395,000 hectares. The production of rice and tomatoes, for example, has doubled, and the process of mechanization was accelerated. The cooperatives born from the occupations 
have updated life and work conditions, fixed salaries, lower difference between men's salaries and women's salaries. Lower, but it was not exactly the same. Construction of kindergartens and daycare facilities. However, the ideological internal conflicts, Portugal almost had a civil war after the Portuguese revolution. So, uh, the ideological internal conflicts during the revolutionary process did not allow the deepening of this new rural model based on socialist proposals. Even if in 1976 the Portuguese agrarian reform is included in the new Republican constitution, one year later a new law will end with the land occupations and will start a surrendering process. The socialist model will not be applied in Portugal and the end of the land occupations marks the birth of an era of unemployment, rural Exodus and the return of landlordism. However, if the end of a new rural model ends in Portugal during the 80s, in Brazil the landless occupations and organization are stronger. The new Brazilian constitution approved in 1988 guarantees the land expropriation whenever the land whenever the land breaks its social role. In the 90s, the MST, the MST extends its influence in spite of persecution, murders, and, and murders against its activists. In 2005, MST founded the National School, the Florista Fernandes National School. I think you all know, uh, or most of you know, this uh, from uh, this school. Jad uh, lived there, so. But I'm going to pass only a few minutes and to show also. Uh, we talked about uh, before the how culture. Sometimes we want to separate culture from for of the economic part. So here with the MST school, all these are, uh, I don't know how to say it in English, so all these are together. We cannot think economy without thinking in education, without thinking in culture, without thinking in political formation. So everything is connected. And this idea, idea of totality and of a knowledge that has to, uh, to touch all parts of life, if we want, uh, as its example uh, on this school. Sorry, I'm very bad. It's terrible. So. organizações de trabalhadores do campo e da cidade que lutam pela transformação social. 
começa a ganhar forma a ideia de construção de uma escola nacional. So, uh, because it's almost it's late. And in conclusion, you can see this video on the internet, <laughs> the 30 minutes. In conclusion, uh, during the Portuguese and Brazilian dictatorships, during the Portuguese revolution and during the Brazilian democratization process that started in 1985, always the progressist and revolutionary movements of both countries and social movements of both countries at a narrow contact. The best example is the fundraiser that permitted the construction of this school. The main fundraiser came from the, came, came from the selling of a book with photos of the Brazilian photographer Sebastião Salgado. I don't know if you know him. With a CD with four musics composed by the Brazilian musician Chico Buarque and a text, and a, with a text written by the Portuguese communist writer José Saramago, that was the winner of the Literature Nobel Prize in 1980, uh, 1998. So, once again, culture and the economic struggle are, are together. One of Chico Buarque's music dedicated to the MST is named Raised from the Ground. Well, in 1980, the Portuguese writer José Saramago had published one of its first novels dedicated to the landless South Portuguese peasants named Raised from the Ground. So, when Chico Buarque uh, makes this music, it's dedicated to all landless peasants on Brazil, but it's also dedicated to José Saramago, a communist writer, who starts his, uh, his, who starts his uh, work, who starts his work precisely with a book with this name, Raised from the Ground. And I want to finish this presentation with that music that Chico Buarque dedicated to the MST and that is dedicated to all, uh, to all peasant, landless peasants. Only to, in this photo is the presentation of the book and of the CD. There's in the first place there's João Pedro Stedel, it is the porte parole the landless movement. After José Saramago, Sebastião Salgado with no hair, and Chic Buarque, very all very young. It was the music we were listening when we were seeing the video of the National MST School. Como um branco desgarrado pois na terra, como assim levantados do chão, como embaixo dos pés numa terra, como água escorrendo da mão, como em sonho correndo uma estrada, deslizando do mesmo lugar, como em sonho perder a so, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the time. Uh, so, uh, yeah, unfortunately I'll be leaving very soon, so uh, uh, I just want to say a few words just, just to show my gratitude to be here. And uh, we have been talking at uh, quite a 
wide range uh, spectrum of, of, of different perspectives from a geopolitical threats to the financialization of, of, of uh, global capitalism, and then but also down to the grassroots of a, a societal index. And then uh, and all those this this these all these different things have given me some some uh, quite uh, uh, actually I have a. Uh, a little bit different perceptions about them, but uh, a different perspective out of the same context. Uh, so, but yeah, so uh, I would just use this opportunity to to uh, to put forward that uh, actually we are developing this uh, theory with the global university. We recorded the uh, lecture series last month after Professor Ren uh series. So, see the, 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 the lecture series called a, The Flights of the Bumble Sea, of course, taking care of uh, it's, it's some uh, gimmicks from the flights of the Bumblebee classical piece, because just to make the notion of its very orthodoxy, classical music is an orthodox kind of thing. So, uh, it's, uh, we're talking about the, the uh, we're trying to actually, uh, it was very, very much inspired from, by the works of and Professor Wen Chujun, but what we're trying to do is to go uh, uh, further down to earth kind of uh, understanding of how this, this thing has uh, been doing. So anyway, and, and it will be online maybe uh, in a few months, but uh, yeah, uh, basically overall, it's talking about the three different flights that is happening throughout the, uh, our capitalism uh, civilization from the industrial flight at first, and then the, the capital uh, labor flight and the cap capital flight that makes a whole networks of, of this, this confusion. So of course it started from the uh, industrialization flight from, I will use the West and the rest, it's because it's, I think it's, it's more comfortable for me right now. So we have the industrialization flight from the West to the rest, with all these uh, VOP uh, bottom pyramid uh, uh, logics, I'm not going to go into the details. And then we have the labor flights of the uh, uh, high skill uh, uh, workers from the West to the rest to accompany these multinational uh, operations to be the directors, managing directors, so on and so forth. And then we have the capital flights going back to the, from the rest, going back to the West through a, a, a banking mechanism, uh, uh, IPO, but also in a very down level of where you have uh, expatriates that is overpaid for works that are mo mostly not as much as the local local uh, people pay, uh, that would transfer back to the countries. So it seems that you know it's, it looks like uh, the usual thing that we have, but and then we suggesting that there might be actually a uh, it become uh, it creates a snowball effect. So what happens is that, and then we have the labor flight complex. Why? Because uh, first, uh, the uh, 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 first the the Western world had started the development earlier. So they have started and they have uh, made, uh, contained the modern life earlier. And then, so modern lifestyle also created a decrease in population in general, because we have the different uh, urban lifestyle in compared to a few decades back. And then that urged the need to increase population within the internal uh, 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 countries of you know, the Western civilization. So, and then they opened the uh, uh, things like a uh, uh, green visa for uh, 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 for the from the uh, for the uh, uh, high skill labor of the rest to come to the West. But this time, this will create a completely different scheme because this will be a permanent uh, 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 flight because they will offer citizenship and uh, uh, nationalities through uh, uh, academics, proposals, uh, Ivy League in the US or uh, Golden Triangle in the UK and so on and so forth. And then, but also to the multinational companies themselves. We have NASA, uh, Lockheed Martin, and then even Airbus and Boeing. But you know, the capital is never flew back to the rest because they are, they are moving 
you know, you see, it's, it's a different uh, uh, case of identity. But and then it creates problem in the West with the indigenous uh, high skill uh, 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 competition. So that's that's one point. The other point, the common things that we we've been talking also in, in the other day was the informal uh, labor flight from the rest to the to the west. It's a common thing that we know. But then the problem is that as the West develop furthermore, it become living costs become expensive. And then the living costs become expensive, it creates a more bigger problem for the uh, uh, uneducated or, or less educated population on the West just to live in their own territories. They have like high competition from, from uh, immigrants, but and then there are also not many industries because the industry is being transferred to the, to the rest. And then it creates all this problem. It's, uh, uh, not only uh, externally it will uh, create these geo geopolitical uh, problems. With, uh, for instance, uh, ISIS, I always thought ISIS is not ideological problem. It's basically made up of uh, all the Middle East problems, uh, oil problems, but and then it trans and then the internet make it viral because now the bombings that is happening in in, uh, in uh, Europe and even the, the killings that is happening in the U.S. it's in the grassroots. It got nothing to do with the ISIS in the Middle East. You know, it's all just these troubled kids, and the troubled kids came out of these internal problems. So so. That creates a whole complex. So now, uh, this brings me to to my uh, 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 my 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 notion is that is that we always been talking about you know the financial crisis and then the, the problem in the in the rest. But uh, uh, I don't know if it's intended or not or otherwise. But there are also big problems on the West. Now, we, we always have this division where the rest only talks about the rest and the West talks about the West. The problem is that we are living in the one on Earth. So, so because of these problems that is happening on the West, it for, it's, 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 a, it's a matter of survival of the fittest. So, and then the, in, of the countries in the West will become forever more dependence to this oligarchy, uh, 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 tea party, uh, tea party uh, uh, concerts uh, and powers because they practically live under subsidies. Because it's like, uh, it, it's in the Western world, it's like only the 30% to 40% of the populations that made up out of the whole, almost all of the GDP. So, and then this power will have enough power because of the nation are so strong to furthermore exploit the South and uh, the rest because they need to make a, life, make a living. So the whole thing is actually connected. So, so, the, so my, my, my message is that actually is that I think we need to really try to, to uh, despite of the fact that we have all these problems in, in, in the geopolitical scales and everything. But I think we really need to start to diminish this wall. You know, there are really no west or east or west or north or south. It doesn't really exist. You know, and then because uh, uh, what I learned is that we had the two recently, very recently, 2007, 2008, 2009 uh, global uh, crisis that is happening, in, in starting from the U.S. that's spread all over the world. Now you can imagine. I, I think we're just actually counting, not days, but counting years. The, the Europe might, but US may be still safe, but Europe might collapse. Society, societal, in a societal level, might collapse very soon. Yeah. And that, if it ever happened, it will spread everywhere. You know, this, this, is, this is like just the simple closing statement is that actually we're all on it together. You know. so I always think that 
these kind of things, uh, hegemony and things uh, that is more, uh, and when I'm thinking about it deeper, you know, deep from mind, body, and then going to the soul, it's just basically, uh, it's, it's a matter of survival, you know. And then I never really thought of it as an ultra-nationalism thing kind of thing. So, so we, I think we need to think a bit differently and and to understand the whole thing in the global scheme. And you know, if you have uh, American superpower, you have a uh, uh, China superpower, you have Russia superpower. It doesn't matter. It's still superpower. The whole thing, like the whole story, will just just be the same. I think, in, in my opinion. So I think we we need to make that. Uh, a paradigm uh, shift uh, to, to these whole uh, uh, subdivisions. Okay, thank you very much. So the song is very look like a very popular song, but the the content is that. We cannot endure any more hope, hope. <laughs> so previous present. So, the, so it is combined with the old uh, social movement with the new, the new social movement for the young people. So it is. Okay, it is more old social movement style. And uh, the, my colleague uh, Lee Seung Hwan uh, from Korea, he is a real activist from 80s on. And uh, though this kind of uh, candlelight movement uh, look like uh, some kind of anachro anarch anarchistic way of organization, but uh, there are a lot, lots of uh, organizational activists uh, sweat and the dedication were there. And uh, I will give a short comment from uh, from Lee Seung Hwan from Korea, because he, he has been, from 80s on, he, he has been working as a full-time activist. Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot speak English, so uh, I speak Korean and uh, translate English. So, uh, uh, 촛불혁명, 촛불투쟁이 에, 그 노렸던 그러니까 촛불투쟁의 대상으로 했던 가장 중요한 것몇 가지가 있습니다. 그 중에 하나는 아, 발전 국가에 대한 항상 아, 아, 그, 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 에, 발전 국가 아, 발전 국가에 대한 환상은 그 우리나라뿐만 아니라 북한, 중국 어, 어디도 대부분 있습니다. 아, 그래서 그 발전 국가로 만들어낸 어, 허상으로부터 어, 깨어나야 된다는 게첫 번째였고 그리고 두 번째는 아, 멸사공공 아, 그러니까 소위 국가를 위해서 우리가 모든 걸 바쳐야 된다 그러니까 이런 것이 아니고 어, 자중자의 스스로를 지키고 국가 를 위해서 우리가 뭘 하는 게 아니라 국가가 우리를 지켜야 되는 거다. 그래서 한국에서 많은 사람들이 보수 정권 하에서 당신은 정말 안녕하시냐고 안녕들 하시냐고 묻기 시작했고 그것이 깨어 있는 시민들의 힘으로 이 나타난 게이 촛불 혁명이었습니다. 그럼 촛불 혁명이 세 번째로 어, 문제 삼고 있는 것은 안보 국가입니다. 어, 안보 국가가 어, 세월호 한국의 그 유명한 세월호 사건 같은 것이 결국은 국가 안보를 가장 중요했던 국, 중요시했던 국가가 어, 사람들의 생명을 무참하게 희생시키는 이제 이런 걸 보면서 안보 국가의 허상을 깨닫게 됐고 그래서 어, 안보 국가 대신에 새로 사람들이 참여하는 직접 민주주의를 통해서 스스로의 평화권을 획득하고 인권과 여러 부분들을 직접 참여해서 만들어내지 않으면 대의제 정치로는 아무것도 할수 없다는 그러니까 이런 그 깨달음들이 있었고 그래서 
전 세계가 이뭐 트럼프 정부가 들어선다거나 또는 브렉시트가 일어난다거나 이런 여 같은 전 세계가 우경화되고 있는 상황 속에서 한국의 촛불 투쟁은 직접 민주주의의 힘을 통해서 그 새로운 세상 비전 기존의 발전 국가나 안보 국가를 넘어서는 그 직접 민주주의에 근거한 새로운 이 그, 공동체를 만들어 갈수 있다는, 그러니까 이런 것을 보여줬다라고 생각하고, 그 점이 아마 앞으로 한국 사회뿐만 아니라, 동아시아나 여러, 어, 나라에 걸쳐서도 저는 굉장히 중요한 모범이 되고, 여기서부터 우리가 출발할 수 있는 많은 지점과 교훈들을 얻을 수 있을 거라고 생각합니다. So the, we thought, we called uh, it is a candlelight revolution. So why it is revolutionary? It is a revolution is related with uh, some kind of a, uh, deconstruction and also related with the reconstruction. So first we started with the deconstruction of a developmental state. So we are all mystified with the de developmentalist ideology. <laughs> And second is the statism. So always the state, we should obey to the state rule. So, so, uh, so it is kind of deep for the deconstruction of statism. And the third one is the state can, state is the only body who can guarantee our security. So it is the, for the deconstruction of security, state securityism. So, Three, so all those who have agreed on the deconstruction of three levels of existing ideology, they were together to recreate the state of our own way. So uh, in that sense, it is related with we can make a state of our own way. So under the ideology of a direct democracy and a more participatory way. So I think uh, he thought that uh, in current situation that they say many paradigm shift and uh, uh, including the West, especially United States and the UK, many countries are go right go right wing in their political choice, but uh, uh, in Korean uh, candlelight revolutionary uh, favor of uh, participation can be a kind of a, a source of a, a hope, for, for not only for Korea, for, for Asia, and also some kind of a, uh, the long uh, forgotten memory of a revolution of the West. So, uh, so thank you for us uh, for sharing this kind of uh, our vivid experience. Thank you. <laughs> productive, enlightening, uh, encouraging uh, two and a half days of uh, very intensive high-level discussions, analysis uh, of uh, what is going on in the world today, not only in Asia. And uh, we have been quite fortunate to have some of the, the, the best minds in, uh, in Asia with us for these two and a half days. And I'm sure we, are, we all profit immensely, uh, intellectually, uh, spiritually, and uh, from the discussions. So the, the, the next step, of course, is uh, you know, what is to be done to, uh, to quote Lenin. Uh, after all of this analysis, these discussions, these facts uh, that have been presented before us, what is the role that uh, a uh, social movement that stands on the left of the political spectrum, like ARENA, uh, should play as uh, intellectuals, but as uh, more than intellectuals, but also as activists and practitioners in the arena of social change. So uh, that is something that uh, still is left hanging, I think, on the agenda. I don't know, can work towards something more concrete, and something more sustainable and lasting. Thank you. I'd like to invite uh, Professor Lee Jung-ok to say a few words.
Thank you, Pastor Kinchi, and uh, and also all the participants to, who can pour their uh, intellectual and uh, activist uh, uh, experience and the wisdom to us, and uh, we we can create our own uh, space for those kind of discourse can go, and also. Uh, we uh, have realized that our task uh, is uh, a kind of re-decolonization of our intellectual conceptualization. So Arena has tried that line from 80s on. So we have a very senior fellows who guided us uh, in our early days. And uh, we can see that many of young scholars who also tried uh, their own struggle. Uh, try to find uh, some kind of uh, decolonized uh, concept with surrounded with the uh, colonized uh, intellectual institutional uh, rules and basis so but I think uh, uh, because we can we can believe in each other so in that sense uh, uh, always when we can meet in arena space in, especially in Lingnan University, we are very well fed and well cared, <laughs> and uh, we we feel it is a liberated space. So, in that sense, uh, I really feel thank, and uh, I feel my additional home in Lingnan. Thank you very much. <laughs>